we're going to talk about a particular uh, challenge that we faced in healthcare in Scotland. We're going to talk a bit about how we tackled that. We're going to tell you where we've got to, uh, because uh, that, those improvements are not yet completed. We're going to talk a bit about what we learned from that and, and, and where we're taking it. Uh, and we're going to try and explain uh, why this might matter to you. So while we're going to talk about a specific health issue, we're going to try and talk about it in generic terms uh, and draw out some generic issues. We're going to try and relate the story that we tell you to this um, three-step improvement framework that's in your programme. Um, always when you draw these things, you, you draw them with hard lines between the three bits. There aren't any hard lines between the three bits of this. This is a, a, a continuum. It's not really in three separate steps or chunks. Um, but we think, as we look at the evidence, that there are these three components that typically sit alongside successful transformation and improvement. And the first is about thinking about the, the big vision, the aim, and the strategic context of what you're doing, hence the changing the world metaphor. The second bit is normally about creating the right kind of conditions, the right capacity in our staff, the right culture, the right level of challenge and support in your system to enable the improvement to happen. And the third is the implementation. And so we'll, we'll try and relate our story about the patient safety program in, in Scotland to this framework. To do that, there's going to be a bit of retrofitting. So we might as well just admit that up front. We did not have this uh, when we started, uh, at least not in those explicit terms. We did not have this when we started the, the, the um, improvement program that Jason and I are going to talk about. But actually, um, it was remarkably easy to do that retrofitting, to see what we did in the context of um, this improvement framework. Because what this is really about is about piecing together what the critical components of those successful change programmes might be and trying to give all of us in this room who are engaged in the kind of work that Mr Swinney was talking about some kind of shared language and approach so that when we talk about improvement we're all talking about roughly the same kind of thing. The other thing we'll try and do as we go through this is pick up these six questions. These are again in your programme. If you look at page 12, you'll see these in your programme. You can take them away with you. And in a number of slides, you'll see in the top left-hand corner of the slide a number. And the number relates to which of these six questions we thought, we, in hindsight, we were addressing when we did what we did. So I'll come back to the improvement framework at the end. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm going to hand you over to Jason, who's going to just talk a bit about uh, some of the language that we'll use here, because we're conscious we come from a healthcare uh, environment, and we'll talk about stuff that uh, actually I really know what we're talking about, so there's a fair chance that you might not either. Um, and then uh, he'll get a bit of audience interaction, potentially. I'll try. Morning, everybody. Well, that was an interactive moment. So, so the, you're going to hear th three specific jargon words that the healthcare people in the room now understand. Four years ago, they didn't know what these words meant, but now they do. So in, in order to avoid that horrible feeling where you all get irritated by words, I'm going to do that. Then we're going to introduce the problem we're trying to solve, and then Derek will give you some more technical details of what that problem is. So you're going to hear three things in particular. You're going to hear about reliability. And when we talk about reliability within healthcare, and particularly within the safety of healthcare, we mean getting the thing to everybody who needs it. So getting whatever the intervention is to everybody who needs it. So a flu vaccine to 100% of the people who require the flu vaccine. An intervention to avoid MRSA, to avoid C. difficile, hand washing. Everybody who should wash their hands washes their hands every single time they should do it. That's reliability. Bundles are a technical way of bringing together multiple standards and guidelines. You all have them. We have them too. We have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them in glossy brochures on shelves. How do you take those hundreds of things that your staff and you are meant to do and make them into a thing that can actually be implemented? That's a bundle. And a bundle is usually four or five elements that every day, every patient in my context should get. So you'll hear about a number of bundles later on. You'll hear one about central line infections. You'll learn more today about central line infections than any person should ever know. 
And one of the elements of central line infections is the bundle we have used to eradicate them. So that's why you need to understand what a bundle is. And it's just a series of evidence-based steps. You could have them in justice, you could have them in education, you can have them in the parole board, you can have them any way you like. But in healthcare, they are to do with eradicating whatever the thing is we're trying to eradicate. And then I'm gonna spend a little bit of time later on talking about what we mean by collaboratives. We don't just mean collaboration, worthy and appropriate though collaboration is, we actually mean a very specific improvement methodology called a collaborative with a capital C. And I'll draw you a diagram a little bit later of what that might look like. So I want you to imagine you're on Google. Does everybody know what, everybody knows what that is, yeah? So, so you're on Google, you've moved into a new area with your family, and you're looking for a general medical practitioner. Or you're looking for a hospital to do your hip replacement. You're looking for a form of healthcare. You might be looking for a dentist, maybe an optician. So you're on Google, and lo and behold, you find an item of data. It's unusual, but you've found an item of data. And the item of data you've found is patient satisfaction in three practices. That's the only thing you now know. But it's evidence-based, it's real. It perhaps is from the Better Together survey that we do across the NHS every year. Who wishes to go to practice A? Is anybody thinking practice A is too good to be, any cynics in the room thinking that's <laughs> clearly too good to be true? I would like the least patient status. Okay, so we've chosen to go to practice A, roughly speaking. Stay with me. The data's not real. Just stay with me for the purposes of the trial. So you Google again, or you get your 14-year-old to do it for you, and you end up with another item of data. And this item of data, this time, is accommodated appointments. So this is the number of times they're able to see you when you wish to be seen. So now you have two elements in your complexity. So you know how satisfied the previous crowd of population were, and you know what percentage of appointments are accommodated. Now, anybody want to switch? You, this is slightly sexist, but usually mums switch. Because mums are usually willing to give up a little satisfaction for some convenience. Because their lives are so complex that they'll move over. So is anybody willing to give up some satisfaction for convenience? It's a room of senior executives. I imagine some of you are. You want seen when, when you're available. You can't always wait for somebody else. So now, now we've made some kind of judgment in our heads about this service that's being provided. But you Google again, you'll see how this is going. You Google it, there's only four, don't worry. We're not gonna be here for 60 minutes. You Google again, you get another piece of data, and, and I, I, I so wish this piece of data existed. It's cure, okay? <laughs> now, I can get you this for some diseases, but I can't get you it for many. But this is cure. So now you know this is the people who got better. So now you know satisfaction, accommodated appointments, and whether they're flipping gonna fix you or not. That might be important, that's outcome measure. So, anybody wanna switch? Or are we just gonna take, we're gonna think now, it's getting a bit complicated, I'll just take the one that looks kinda average. I'll take kinda the best. Now, the, the, some, some crowds suggest that the least, the patient satisfaction will clearly be a man. The, the, this will be a man doctor who's horrible to everybody, but actually gets the best results. So I would never suggest such a thing. But it, when you show this to rooms of physicians and surgeons, the surgeons say, well, this is us. We're horrible to everybody, but we're really good. And the physicians say, well, we are lovely to everybody, but we're a bit rubbish. <laughs> so you, you know, you've made some choices. Now, the last item is gonna be the most shocking for you, and we're gonna, it's gonna lead us into the challenge which we were trying to solve. Because healthcare is not as simple as perhaps you've been led to believe. And the last item you find on the web, and you can increasingly find this number, is harm-free care. So not the disease I go with, but will I be harmed by the care I receive? Will I get an infection if I go to that hospital? Will I fall over and break my hip if I go to that general practice and they don't have a health visitor that fixes me the way I want? Will I get self-management in the way I should be allowed to get self-management or will something interfere? So now you know the harm-free care rate in those units. So in practice C, 
25% of the patients are harmed by something that the healthcare system does to them. In practice A, about 5% are harmed. Now you're interested. So now you've maybe changed your view about where you want to go. That's the challenge that the Scottish Patient Safety Programme is trying to solve. Derek. Thanks, Jason. It's not just a Scottish problem, this uh, harm thing. There's been a lot of work, there's a lot of analysis in this area, uh, and it, it shows broadly similar data. So if you rely on people um, reporting harm, and you see it at about 10%, roughly, globally, uh, of, of, ca of cases. If you go looking for it, rather than rely on it being reported to you, you it's much more in the region of 25%. Uh, again, globally, it doesn't matter where you go. If you went to the US, you would find this kind of data. It's broadly the same in the UK and Australia and most of Europe. Um, there, we use a tool in the, the patient safety program called the Global Trigger Tool which is about a kind of deep dive into case notes, actively looking for uh, harm to patients. And uh, it's, again, it's been used right across uh, healthcare in a number of countries and in a number of kinds of systems. And you find broadly the same kind of numbers. Uh, so there is harm in our healthcare system. And the, the, the issue we wanted to fix um, was we wanted to reduce it. And we wanted to reduce it significantly. And we wanted to reduce it right across our system. And this is really why. Because um, you learn so much about harm from looking at the data and looking at the academic evidence of which I said, as I've said, there is plenty. Um, but this is um, a commentary on what people said about the care that was given to their families in a hospital in England. Um, and I'm sure you'll agree that's just not acceptable. And that's the kind of stuff that the patient safety programme in Scotland is designed to fix. Um, we're conscious too that we, we have other issues to resolve. There are a, a range of um, challenges for us in healthcare. Uh, Scotland actually does reasonably well. Um, Graeme Dixon was showing me in, 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 the, uh, in the coffee lounge before we started an OECD report that suggests healthcare in the UK is amongst the best and healthcare in Scotland is better, in my view, I would say this, wouldn't I, better than in other bits of the UK. Um, but we've got some issues that we need to resolve. Uh, and we were in a hurry to do it. So that suggested to us that relying on um, kind of standard practice wouldn't really cut it for us. Um, again, this is a piece of academic research that shows it takes 17 years to get 14% of evidence into practice. Um, we're looking for much more evidence into practice, and we're looking for it more reliably, and we're looking for it more quickly. What did we do to try and, and solve these issues? Um, We found a solution in quality improvement, defined in these kind of terms, the combined and unceasing efforts of everyone, healthcare professionals, patients and their families, researchers, payers, planners, administrators, <coughs> educators, to make the changes that will lead to better outcomes, better system performance and better professional development. Um, a really challenging set of issues to resolve. Uh, but we felt that this was a whole system uh, problem and it needed a whole system solution. We did have some options where, and we did think about uh, options. We've been trying, as I said, the evidence base for this is quite long lasting. People have been trying to sort these things for quite a long time. Uh, we could just keep on doing what, we were, what we'd always done and just do it harder or run faster. Um, but we didn't think that would work. Uh, it hadn't worked previously. History is quite a good predictor of future success. Um, there's always a demand for more data. If only we had more data, um, that, that would tell us how we could solve this, uh, this problem. Um, but as Jason's shown you, sometimes the data shows you some different stuff, stuff that you find hard to, to uh, comprehend enough. And data is absolutely crucial 
to the success of the patient safety programme. But it's not relying on old data, it's generating new stuff. We could have run a pilot, uh, but in a way we already had that. Um, uh, the Health Foundation, which is a UK level um, charitable organisation uh, aimed at um, driving improvement in healthcare in, in the UK, ran a programme called the Safer Patients Initiative. Uh, and NHS Tayside had successfully bid for uh, a place on that programme. Uh, and so we had in Nine Wells Hospital something of a prototype for this. Uh, so that wouldn't have added a great deal of value running more pilots or prototypes. We could have done what they did in the United States, which was to run a campaign. They ran a campaign called the 100,000 Lives Campaign, and they ran it like a kind of political campaign. Um, but what that enables people to do is opt in or out of the campaign. Uh, and uh, our sense was, why would you run something to fix a whole system problem and enable people to opt in or out? And that was, again, why we didn't let boards and hospitals decide what to do. That's kind of what they did in England. Um, everybody needs to do something, but there's no real specificity about what it is. And so what we decided to do was run this national improvement program that was mandatory. Everybody had to do it. But what we did do is give people some um, uh, uh, latitude as to how they did it and in what order they did things and how quickly they moved towards having the program fully implemented. Um, one of the things we've uh, set up for the end of this is uh, we're going to invite a commentary on some of these kind of things from people I've already uh, uh, um, invited to do so. And one of them is Fiona McKenzie. And Jerry, you weren't around at the time, or I would have asked you to. So I'm giving you warning now <laughs> that I'll ask you to comment on some of this stuff as we get to the end of it. Um, so why did we do what we did? Um, the, context, the context was right for us. There was, a, there was an appetite for this. We had uh, some of those th um, pieces of the um, seven steps to change the world already in place. Um, we could. You know, it's one of the benefits of being a relatively small country. We could do this nationally. People um, were receptive to the messages. It was a good fit with uh, clinical and uh, managerial values. We felt we had enough evidence, largely from the Tayside work, that you could make significant changes relatively quickly. And it just felt like the right thing to do. Uh, and that, I think, is a, is a uh, underplayed card in, uh, in our armory. This, this notion that um, part of what being a leader is is about making the right thing easier to do for people, making people, getting people to want to do the right thing. And we felt this was the right thing, and people were telling us they felt it was the right thing. Um, so we launched this uh, national program uh, back in 2007. Um, at that stage, we were still a long way short of having a convincing answer to the six questions. We were okay on number one. You know, we'd done some thinking about what it was we were trying to do. We had some sense of number two because we could use the work that uh, Jerry and his colleagues had started at, at Nine Wells, and we could see the impact of some of those. But we were keen to engage with people about what those improvements might be, and we did make some adaptations as we went along. Um, we thought about quality improvement and we'd, and we'd seen this 100,000 Lives campaign and we'd seen the way in which it operated on the collaborative methodology that Jason's just about to describe to you. So again, we had, we had some idea about um, what was the means of securing Im improvement, but we couldn't really do very much of the rest. Five was a particular challenge for us because we had a handful of people who really knew what this was about. Um, and we weren't absolutely sure that we would be able to spread this. And, and, uh, and spread and sustainability has been a significant challenge for us uh, as we went along. Two quite unlikely people kind of sum up how we were feeling back in 2007 as we started this um, improvement work. One of them was a small American comedian with a large cigar uh, who made this observation about complicated stuff. And it is indeed too bad that the people with all the answers are busy driving cabs and cutting hair. Um, we didn't have many of those folk at the time. Uh, the other is probably even more un unlikely, uh, although uh, some of the NHS chief executives might 
think that I remind them of this person from time to time. Um, of course, any quotes anybody ever uses about Genghis Khan are clearly just made up by the presenter for the purposes <laughs> of the presentation, because there wasn't any paper in those days, no one's really very sure about what he said. But I think if he was going to say something about the dilemma <laughs> that was facing us at the time, this is the kind of thing that he would say. Change is hard, it's complicated, it deserves our attention, but it's doable. And so uh, we're going to move now back to Jason, who's going to tell you uh, exactly what we did. So there's a, there's a challenge now. Do I show you results first or do I show you how we did it? So we've gone for how we did it. So you're going to have to hold on. Now, we wouldn't have chosen our least successful program to show you. OK, we're not daft. So but I'm going to show you methodology first. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about very briefly, so the healthcare people in the room don't need to worry, it's not the 40 results slides that they've seen many times. And uh, so we're going to talk about methodology, because that's the generic purpose of this conference. This conference is not for us to showcase all our great work, although many of you are going to do that. It's much more about learning the how. What, what are the kernels we can learn from each of your pieces of work, and then try and spread that to scale? This is going to grow this diagram. And it's about the collaborative, the breakthrough series collaborative, the so-called breakthrough series collaborative. Like all great inventions, written on the back of a napkin during a very boring dinner. Absolutely true. Don Berwick, who runs, ran the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and now runs the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services in the US, although he's just announced he's leaving because the Republicans won't approve him, unfortunately. He and Paul Batalden, who is an academic in the US, were at a very dull dinner and we're presented with the challenge jointly of trying to spread improvement at scale. And they sat down with their collective brains and they came up with the Breakthrough Series Collaborative Model, which has now swept the world, has been used in healthcare, but also in education and justice in other areas. And people in this room understand it better than me. Fundamentally, what you do is you identify an aim. What is it you're trying to do? notoriously simple, but quite difficult. What is it you're trying to actually do? So we know in the safety program, we are trying to reduce harm. We've just shown you, you maybe didn't know until you came today, that up to 25% of patients in hospitals are harmed. 10% of them today roughly have an infection. So there's 10% before you kick a ball. If you add the ones who fall over and break their hips, the ones with pressure ulcers, the one, you can see how it adds up. Avoidable, Harm. So you select a topic, you bring together experts, people who understand that topic. So you bring together people who know how to stop harm, the infection control people, the critical care doctors, the people who build the facilities in our hospitals. All the experts come together and you decide how you're going to do those changes. So you'll notice in the six questions, one is about what are the changes you're going to make? Do you have a collective view of what is evidence-based and what functions? You then bring together teams. Now, the, the classic collaborative model says up to 100 teams. We had a few more than that. We've got 144,000 employees. We've got 15 delivery systems within the whole structure. And we met here, in fact, next door in the big room, 800 people in January 2008 to start this process, 2007, to start this process. And we had a lot more than 100 teams spread throughout the country. We, are, we were, at the time, we think, the biggest collaborative in the world. And uh, there was a challenge in just corralling those big numbers. You get them to do pre-work. So the pre-work is about getting baseline data and about beginning to read about improvement. The cr one of the crucial points is we're not teaching these people to be better at their job. They already know how to do their job. We're teaching them how to do change and improvement and the science of change and improvement not how to fix infection. You bring them together in what IHI call a learning session. A learning session is just a teaching environment. So you bring them together for two days and you teach them the model for improvement, which I'm going to show you in just a second. And then they spend time in an action period. And action periods are just work. It's just a fancy word to try and stop it sounding like work, but it's just work. And in that action period, they go away and they test these changes that they've learned from one another. And then the cycle goes on. And you do that multiple times. So they meet roughly once a quarter, once every four months. 
and they take the changes and gradually the, the, the system changes, the culture changes. In learning session one, it's very much us on the stage teaching. At learning session two, everybody hates us because they've gone away and tried it and it's really hard and actually they feel very frustrated. At learning session three, there's no stopping them. They're up on the stage themselves, showing their own results to their peer group and they're learning from one another and you almost can stand back completely and just facilitate. Give them a little bit of content, but fundamentally they just run with it themselves. During that period, you're supporting during the learning sessions, you're, in between the learning sessions rather, you're supporting them with a whole lot of other stuff. So you're having calls every week or every month, depending on the subject. You've got an email list serve, which everybody can ask questions, which gets very active around certain subjects. Has anybody done this because we're struggling in NHS borders to do it? Has anybody tried X because we don't know what to do? And they share spontaneously themselves. You can seed it a little bit from the centre, but most of it comes spontaneously from there. That's the breakthrough series collaborative. One method for improvement. Not the only one, it's just the one we chose. We chose it because it works and it's cheap. So it would seem sensible, but there are others. The core change methodology within that is the model for improvement. Again, that comes from IHI. Those of you who are engineers in the room will know that it comes originally from Deming and Duran and then joined together into healthcare by IHI. It's fundamentally three questions. What are you trying to do? How will you know you've done it? And what are you going to do to change? What's your aim? What are your measures? And what are your changes? Now, when you first show that to 600 critical care doctors, they look at you as if, do you think we've gone back to primary school, mate? This is, this is too easy. But actually forcing them into that way of thinking, to write down a name with a number and a time and a date that would focus their minds on making that improvement actually drives change. And then the execution model, which is the plan, do, study, act model. Some of you will know it as, as a slightly different version of that cycle, depending on your history and where you've been educated and where you've come through. But fundamentally, it's about taking a change and using small cycle testing in your workplace at the front line to actually make that change. Don't wait for permission. Don't put it on laminated sheets. Don't send out chief executive's letters. Just get on and change it in your workplace. And all improvement is local. Fundamentally, everything that changes will be at that frontline position. And in our world, that's where the clinician meets the patient. So how do we do it, just before I show you some results of what we actually did? Well, we got goals. We set an aim of a 15% reduction in mortality in five years. A 15% reduction in mortality in five years. I was booed off a stage when I first suggested that as an aim. It's astronomically hard compared to where we were. So nobody believed we could do it. Seriously, nobody believed we could do it. It was deliberately positioned at such a high level because it requires redesign to achieve it. You can't achieve it if you just stand still. Boldness is inherent in that aim. Bringing the people together in the collaborative, and the collaborative is called a collaborative because it brings people into collaboration. Get a model and stick with it. That was our model for improvement. And for us, the people we serve are our patients and families. Without patients and families in the design and in the production of what it is we were going to do, we were lost. And the health service somewhere has lost that, and we were trying to reconnect to that, what we call person-centered care. That's a different environment in your client group and whatever your context is. And then, particularly for our senior clinicians, we had to get data and fact. They won't listen to American models. They, they immediately reject them unless you can prove them in their environment and in their context. And that data was really crucial. Getting to the field was important. So sending executives, many of whom are in this room, out to their environment just to talk about safety became really, really important. So prioritizing safety up the agenda because centrally we decided safety was the most important game in town. So therefore, chief executives, finance directors, HR directors, all out into wards and clinics saying, what, what puts patients at risk today? 
Tell me about the last time something went wrong in this ward in a non-threatening, non-blame way. It took a little bit of time. Some of the chief executives in this room will tell you that that took quite a lot of culture change, both for them and for the staff that they met. Now embedded across the whole healthcare system. Every day, there are safety walk-arounds that happen, getting back to the floor. And then you've already heard me say that we had a number and we had a clock. So it's a 15% reduction by the end of 2012. And then as I've gone around the country trying to talk about this, and others have done that, we've learned that narrative is as, is as important as data. We've learned that stories of patients who are harmed, families who suffer, becomes almost more powerful than the data itself. So this are, these are our bold aims. The top one is the one you need to concern yourself about, unless you want the really in-depth talk, which we can do another day. So what, can we do, what have we actually done? Now, you're going to need one technical thing, so you're going to have to pay attention. In order to understand what we've achieved, you need to understand hospital standardized mortality. Take a breath. We know your risk of death when you come to hospital. Don't tell everybody, but we know your chances of living or dying when you come to hospital. We know, based on your age, your gender, your postcode, your pre-existing conditions, and how that type of person has behaved previously. So we roughly know your chances of dying when you come to hospital. You can work out the extremes yourselves very easily. The middle group is slightly more difficult, and we can statistically do that. So HSMR is the way we compare past with present and future mortality within a hospital. Just counting the number of people who die is not accurate enough because the population has changed. The demographic has changed. So we use a standardized method to try and do that. So if you look at the front here, this is our baseline year. Four dots, we do this every quarter. Four dots, we know the only statistic we're absolutely certain of in Scotland is dead, yes or no. Okay? And even then, there is some, some doubt just at the outskirts of that data. But roughly speaking, we know if you're dead or alive. Okay? So we know who died between 06 between October 06 and September 07, and we know their characteristics. So we know their genders, their postcodes, we know if they had chest disease when they died, we know if they were, had cancer when they died, we know roughly that group of people, and we know their demographic. We then can translate that healthcare system delivery, so the delivery that produced that number of deaths, it's a little bit harsh, but you with me? The delivery that produced that number of deaths, if we move that delivery system forward, we would get the same number of dead people. It's a little harsh, but you're with me. So if we had the same number of expected mortality, that line would be straight. We would continue to have 1.0 as our hospital standardized mortality ratio. Now, the teachers in the room will know that it's a fraction, it's a ratio. So if you have expected deaths over, no, sorry, Real deaths, actual deaths, over expected deaths, you have a ratio. And that's why you get 1.0. If you kill the right number of people, if the right number of people die, your ratio is 1. If less people than expected die, your ratio is less than 1. If more people than expected die, your ratio is more than 1. Are we, are we there? Roughly? My wife's a teacher. She tells never to ask that because if you have to ask it, it means half the room haven't got it. If you're in any doubt... This is a 7% reduction up to March 2011 in hospital standardized mortality across Scotland. Now, this is great news, but it also makes me sweat a little because it's 7% in two years, nine months. Now, on the 30th of November, which is next Wednesday, we get the next quarter's data. So every three months, I have a moment of extreme trauma when that HSMR number comes out, because I feel partly my job depends on it, but also because genuinely more people are alive than would have been before all of these interventions were done. So this is a 7% reduction in two years, nine months, where the, the data is slightly behind, of course, because it takes a little bit of time for people to die once they've been in hospital, etc., etc. This is six hospitals, individual hospitals in Scotland, some of whom have their executives and leaders in this room. I'm going to highlight only one to you, and that's Ayrshire Narn. This is Crosshouse Hospital 
in Ayrshire and Arran. This dot was outside the statistical norms. There was something happening in Cross House Hospital that wasn't the same as all the other hospitals in Scotland. And that required, as question five suggests, moving resources, moving expertise in to help them analyse and work out what was happening. They've now had a 19% reduction in their HSMR. It's one of the safest hospitals in Scotland, so you can safely go. <laughs> Top left is Nine Wells Hospital, an 11% reduction in HSMR, having started from a very low position. Now, you hear a little bit more from Jerry if you go to one of the sessions later on. And then very quickly, what have we done across the whole of Scotland? So I told you you would learn a little about central line infections. If you've ever been or had a relative in critical care in an intensive care unit, you've probably seen a central line infection. A rubber tube that goes into your neck that supplies a route in for drugs, for blood, for anything you require, and a route out for blood, for tests, for blood pressure, etc., etc. It's hugely invasive, and we try not to do it unless we have to, but when you do it, they often get infected. They used to often get infected. If they're in for a long time and the dressing becomes a bit scabby and it's not cleaned every time, it's a hugely common intervention. When I trained, we were taught that central line infections got infected. It was unfortunate, but that was what happened. It was a side effect of care. Scotland has 21 intensive care units. It used to have 30 central line infections a month, roughly, across the whole country. It now has almost none. So this is the first month where we were able to say there was a 30-day period with no central line infections. We are the first country in the world that is able to say there are no central line infections in Scotland. There have been none in June and none in August. When we told the Cabinet Secretary there were none in March, she said, what happened in April? That's the world in which we live. <laughs> but, but you just need to live with that. I think she was partly joking. Not entirely. 18 intensive care units of the 21 have had no infections in 2011. None. I, those of you who don't work in the healthcare system don't quite realise, I don't think, what an achievement that is for these frontline teams. It's truly astonishing. And the three who have had them have had a total of five altogether. We were, getting, we were having 30 a month. We've had five in a year. We know the names. We know the ages. We know the genders. We know the demographics of each of these individual patients. There's no way we would have known that before. Similar infection, but this time with patients on ventilators. It's a 62% reduction in ventilator infection. This is mortality in intensive care units. This is whether you live or die when you go to critical care. About a third of people who end up in critical care die. So a 14% reduction in that number is dramatic. This is C. difficile, a very common infection that you'll have heard. has had a lot of political uh, will to fix. And the Scottish Patient Safety Programme has not fixed any of these things alone. There's a whole load of other things feeding into this. There's a healthcare associated infection agenda. There are all kinds of other things. So please don't relate cause and effect exactly with the safety programme. But that's a world class reduction in C. difficile across every ward in Scotland. Now, Lothian has 280 of them. Glasgow, to tell you the truth, we're not entirely sure how many they've got. They've got a lot. More than 280, because they're even bigger than Lothian. But what, there's a huge number of, the, of, of these places in this complex environment. So let me go back briefly before I hand back to Derek about how, how we've done this. So the, the first step was a very brave minister that we persuaded that announcing to the country that there was too much harm within the healthcare system was a good thing to say. That was a moment in time where it could have gone either way. And it was right at the beginning of the last parliament where we were able to say, look, here's the problem, but also here's the solution. Here's the improvement solution which we will use. Here's the Tayside example. Here's the leadership in Tayside that have delivered this. And here's what we want to do nationwide. And then the leadership within the chief executive community within the chairs, within the medical and nurse directors, within the healthcare system, also persuading them that this was a good thing to do and to prioritise. And then you've already seen, I think, I hope, some of that execution model. Don Abedian, who's a, one of the fathers of quality improvement in the world, said it much more succinctly than me, get the structure right, get the process correct, and you'll get the outcome correct. 
You have, as we have in the health service, the best professionals in the world. I genuinely believe that we have the best public service professionals in the world. But it's no longer enough. Just producing highly qualified, highly technical able and nice people is not enough. They have to work in this hugely complex system which we've established for them. And it's really, really hard. That's what going to the front line teaches you. So we've had to build capacity and capability for improvement, not for teaching or for putting in central line infections, putting in central lines. We've had to teach improvement and change to a cohort of the workforce. At some level, all the workforce need to understand it, but there's 144,000 of them in the NHS. So at another level, we need experts. So what does that mean if we're going to build a sustainable infrastructure that produces highly reliable quality improvement excellence? And who do we need to teach? Well, we've spent time with non-executive board members. We've spent time with executives. We've had the executives and us spend time with their managers. We've spent a lot of time with clinicians, with frontline workers from the royal colleges who are a stakeholder, down to the frontline microsystem teams who drive the change at the frontline. So how do you know how many to make? How many improvers do you need? Well, there's a number of pieces of literature that tell you roughly how many you should make. Brent James, who runs a system in Salt Lake City, Utah, a wonderful healthcare system, one of the best in the world, he says you need the square root of the number of your employees as experts in change and improvement. Now, you don't take these people out. They still do their job, but you train them as improvement and change agents. There's a science behind how to do that improvement and change. So that means the mathematicians in the room have already done it. But if you're NHS Tayside, you have 14,000 employees, you need 120 experts, roughly. Now you're going to have to cascade that through your system, you're going to have to have different levels of people. You, you, you get the idea. The other way of thinking of it, and much harder, is nobody in your organisation should be more than two steps away from an employee, from an expert. So lay out your organisation in an org chart and work out where your experts are. So it's not only number, it's distribution. And we've done this in a few organisations, and Jerry won't mind me saying that in NHS Tayside, the bulk of the improvement expertise is in Nine Wells Hospital, not in Perth Royal Infirmary. So now Perth Royal Infirmary needs a capacity building plan to get some more experts in Perth Royal Infirmary, because Nine Wells went first. So it's all very well having the numbers, but how have you distributed those numbers? And Tom Nolan, who is one of IHI's experts, says that they shouldn't be more than two steps away. So work out where your line management system is in terms of those people. A few words about where we think this is all headed. Um, so beyond safety for us. Uh, and we've taken those decisions in the light of what people told us were their priorities. One of the first Jason mentioned earlier, our Better Together uh, survey that we do to get patient experience. One of the first things we used that survey to do was collect information about people's priorities. And then we cross-checked that against what people had, how people had responded to similar surveys elsewhere in the world. The same things came up again and again. And so our safety program is designed to, um, to meet some of these expectations that people have, but it doesn't meet them all. And so we thought, well, what more do we need to do? And that really lies in our quality strategy uh, for NHS Scotland, which is now our kind of uh, central strategic um, improvement program. The quality strategy and the safety program sits within it, but we also do work on person-centeredness and effectiveness. And the quality strategy will really be the testing ground, if you like, moving forward for us in the NHS uh, for the three-step improvement framework. Um, and I hope that the description that Jason and I have given you of the, the patient safety programme and its match with the improvement framework gives you similar confidence to, that we have that you know, this, is, this is the right kind of environment in, in, in which to do this. Um, so where are we going to... What are we going to do with this? Well, as I said, we, what we've tried to do here is connect this from an approach that's really about, at the, at the top end, transformational change and how you do it, uh, all the way through to um, getting improvement in localities. And as Jason said, the key lesson for, from the work we've done on safety is all improvement is local. Uh, and so that's, uh, 
I, I was thinking about this a lot as I've been thinking about what to say to you today. And if you look at the example in your slide pack, the arrow goes one way. And actually, the arrow needs to go two ways. You need to learn from the local improvement and, uh, and adapt your conditions and adapt your, uh, your vision, aim, and context in the light of that, of that local uh, experience. We did not just invent this out of the ether. It, it, it has an evidence base. It has an evidence base in the, this work that Cotter did, where he looked at transformational change programs across a range of environments and identified what were the common features in the successful ones. Um, and I don't think it's, it's coincidental that he identifies three broad themes in the same kind of way as we've identified three broad steps. Um, Jason talked about Deming's work. Again, it tells you the same kind of stuff. Get the vision and the strategy right, build the right kind of coalitions, and you've got a be your best chance of success. And so it's an interpretation of that evidence and an attempt to, to place it within that strategic landscape about public services reform that Mr Swinney described that led us to the seven steps to change the world, the seven things that we would have to do, the, the telling of, of uh, the, the, sorry, the clarity about the compelling vision, the telling of the story, uh, the clear articulation of um, the fact that we've selected the right things to do that will enable us uh, to, to uh, secure the improvement. Clarity about how we're going to secure the improvement. The, the absolute requirement to engage the workforce in this. That's where the power for improvement will come from. The need to make the change work locally but reliably. So that, that notion about thinking about how you deploy your capacity and how you spread. Uh, and the fact that um, the, the resilience of this and the authorization for it is provided by the guiding coalition. And one of the things we, we are trying to do in this conference over the next day is help build that guiding coalition. I think we need to be part of the guiding coalition. Um, there's uh, people, hopefully, people who have been to previous uh, Scottish Leaders Forum meetings will be familiar with that, that kind of model. Those of you who are not, there is some underpinning for it set out in your pack. I think it's on page 11. The second bit, the, the creating the right conditions, these are designed to be generic. Um, and I'm, I don't, I'm not making any apology for that. They're specifically designed to be generic, to apply to a range of um, environments. They're designed to apply to any implementation, any implementation theory that you might have. I hope Jason's shown you that they apply if you decide to do a collaborative. But equally, I think they apply if, the, if your choice of improvement methodology is to performance manage, if your choice of improvement methodology is to learn from uh, scrutiny, if, if it's designed to be used for self-assessment and for challenge, uh, and it's designed to get the, the leverage points for improvement. It won't be perfectly designed. Uh, this is something that we're trying out. Um, and uh, it will be much more powerful if we all try it and we all uh, learn where it works and where it doesn't and then we adapt uh, as we go on. Um, this has given people some trouble. Um, the fact that what we're recommending to you is that this is a bundle, as Jason uh, expressed it. Um, that we, are, that we think that this will be at its most reliable if you do all of these things. So that improvement that Jason showed you at Cross House Hospital uh, came from a realisation that uh, there were a bundle of things that they could do largely around uh, earlier um, rescue of deteriorating patients uh, that would lead to the improvement. But it was the fact that they did all of the stuff that really made the difference. So this will be hard. It will be hard to, 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 to answer yes to all of these questions. Um, but my advice, my, my um, proposition to you, is that it's worth the effort. Only proceed if all six are yes. Satisfy yourself. Um, be explicit about 
the choice that you make. The, the collaborative and the model for improvement won't be the right thing to do in all of the circumstances. And there, there will be other ways. You're going to listen today in the course of these parallel sessions to some of the alternatives to the collaborative methodology. The key, I think, is to make your choice on the basis of the evidence and stick with it. Um, think about these things. Um, there are three key components to this. Do you have the will to make the change? Do you have the ideas that will support that will? And will you be able to implement? We, as you can see, that this is another uh, Institute for Healthcare Improvement slide, hence the fact to talk about execution in America. We might talk about implementation. Um, something that you might want to think about doing is judging your readiness on each of these three requirements. Is there the will in the organisation to make the change? Do you have the right kind of ideas? And do you, have, do you know how you're going to implement? Commonly, uh, implementation is the thing that people either don't think about in advance or don't have the capacity uh, to do. This, I think, is uh, inherently true. Quality is never an accident. It requires uh, good choices, um, the right kind of intentions, and intelligent direction, effort, and execution. The, other, the final thing I want to say before we get our respondents to, um, to say something, um, and then we try and capture some, some lessons from this, uh, is be ambitious. I think that was the, the thing I took uh, most clearly from what John Swinney was say, saying to us. That, that just because we're not doing um, what uh, others might describe as radical stuff doesn't mean to say that we are not ambitious. What could be more ambitious than wanting to change the world? So be ambitious. Be more ambitious uh, than these people uh, who uh, Jason and I came across when we happened to be in the States at the same time <laughs> in 2005. We, together, are capable of much more than adequate yearly progress. Um, that's been a real kind of whistle-stop tour around the Scottish Patient Safety Programme. We hope it's given you some food for thought, some things that you will want to, to consider as you get into your um, parallel sessions. And also, um, Jason and I will be around if there are questions that you want to ask, you know, please, please come and ask them. Um, but we want to finish this bit just by um, firstly get, getting some responses from those people who are asked in, in, at the start to think about how they, how they might respond to this. And we're going to start with two people from, uh, from the NHS who have been directly involved in this stuff. Because you might just be listening to Jason and I say, that's it's the, it's those guys' job to talk about this in glowing terms. But how does it actually feel when you're the chief executive with a a hundred other priorities and, uh, uh, and a huge amount of uh, uh, um, resource at your fingertips to deploy to various things. How do you actually make this happen? How does it feel on the ground? Fiona, you're going to tell people from your perspective. A couple of reflections from me. Um, first time I went to the, the, the big leadership event that happened here, uh, I remember being very sceptical about this because we had an American uh, presentation. It was one of these, yo, Scotland, are you ready? And I thought, oh, God, you know, how is this going to go down when I get back to the ranch? I couldn't quite see the application. And it's a really serious point because it is about the cultural bit being right. I think the thing for me was if I take something like um, intensive care being a very good example, we had some really good work happening at that point already in intensive care in terms of trying to reduce infections. But what we couldn't get was reliability. And what this process gave us was reliability. So for me, that, that was a, a, a major thing. Um, I think also thinking about how you, how you measure improvement and how people sort of got excited about their data. Um, I remember... Uh, once we'd got a run of reliability in terms of reduction of infections, having an infection, and we all knew about it because it was felt to be a huge disaster, whereas, as, as you're saying, um, 
beforehand we'd never have known about it. it it was probably a thing happening very frequently and we weren't we didn't have that sort of uh, profile on it other reflection uh, jason uh, about the walkabouts um we started doing the walkabouts in in most of the acute hospital areas first of all and we then went into mental health we'd done two rounds in the acute hospital interestingly by the time we we're doing the second round the whole culture and the way of discussing issues was different um, I hadn't even realised that it got different till I went into mental health, which generally you would see would be a more demanding environment. And people there were sort of saying, um, oh, everything's fine here, we've got no problems, nothing that we want to discuss. Whereas we'd gone through that entire loop uh, in the acute side and people were much more reflective about what they were doing, much happier to talk about things that were problems. And we were much more able to take these problems away and resolve them. <coughs> Final thing, um, probably the board itself, um, getting the focus of the board away from just looking at things, waiting times, <coughs> sorry I've had a bad throat, waiting times and money and thinking more generally about quality and the broader uh, agenda. So, That's great. very, <coughs> very important. Uh, I think also the other thing worth seeing is it wasn't just about this initiative, it's about this initiative and its broader broader impacts. Yeah. Um, I'm not a health professional, um, so I'm not an expert in patient safety, but one thing I did take from the presentations was the inclusive nature of the approach, the fact that staff were involved, it felt the right thing to do, and that's very much because staff know their job, have the professional expertise, and I think that's the one thing that I've taken away from the presentation. In terms of the approach, um, I made the mistake of admitting to Derek a couple of weeks ago in a conversation that within my own organisation we'd started to look at the six questions and had adapted them in terms of the discussion, the dialogue about how the organisation moves forward within Perth and Kinross Council but also within our community planning partnership, how we move forward in delivering the national and local outcomes and responding to the changing needs of our communities and the response from staff has been very enthusiastic because they believe these are the right questions and so we've been using them in a wider context, not just in terms of specific change and improvement programmes, but to really help us challenge what we're focusing on, how we're making improvement and do we have the right approach. So it's going down very well so far. We're still, I think our session this week was very much about uh, the second question and debating that and reflecting on where we are and moving forward. So, um, staff, very, very positive about the questions. A comment, though, if I may, and that is that staff felt that the theme of changing the world was absolutely ambitious. The message it conveyed was about being ambitious, but it was also about being bold. And this is the time for us in the public sector of Scotland to be bold. However, one comment, Derek, and that was that changing the world felt to them about that we were going to do things for our communities, we're going to think, do things to people. And their preference was about changing our world because the world for somebody living in the poorest communities in Scotland would be quite different from those living in the richer communities in Scotland, but very well received. And so far, we're using the tools very effectively. I mean, this is a reaction to what I've heard for the first time this morning. And I'm going to try and help you, Jason. I don't envy your task. Uh, trying to capture some of this, so I'll, I'll see if I can flag up what I think. I'm only allowed three lessons, Ronnie, you'll have noticed. I've so I've just what? started bulleting them. I've only got two. Uh, we do things economically where I come from. I've only got two points, but I'll work my way up to them. And first of all, I want to say I, th I thought that was a really powerful presentation. Very compelling. So congratulations to both of you um, for the work that you've done in putting that together. If I tried to play it back in my terms, this is what it sounds like to me, okay? Here's an approach that's worked in a particular environment health for a specific problem, safety, okay? Here are the results that we've achieved using this approach. The implied as opposed to stated part, I think, is that potentially this approach could work, i.e. it could generate improvement in other contexts and other environments. I think that's intuitively plausible. So I'll flag up now the two things that I wanted to make by way of response to it. First of all, other improvement approaches are available, and you'll know that. And not all problems are the same. So for me, that leads to maybe a couple of questions. The first one is, what's the relationship between this kind of approach and those that are already being used? 
i.e., can we put this into some wider improvement context? Because that, I think, would help to make the case quite strongly. And then the second one is, what work's been done to, attempt to test out the applicability of this approach to other problems? Because I think that's where some scepticism, healthy scepticism, and perhaps some potential resistance might lie. This works fine in this context for this kind of problem. It's a systematic approach. Other more wicked problems perhaps don't lend themselves so readily to that. How can you show the evidence that that's been thought through and that it potentially could question. apply in that context as well? Great. Thank you very much. And thanks to all four of you for that. So the three things that people seem to be asking us to think about is um, pay attention to the culture. Think about it in, in terms that will mean something to your workforce in your circumstances with the kind of challenges that you've got, with the kind of value systems that are relevant to your organisation. We, we are not saying, this is not the only approach we use in, uh, in healthcare. It's not the only approach we use in quality improvement. And it's not even the only approach we use in safety. It's just one thing that we have found worked for us in a particular set of circumstances, with a particular set of challenges, that was, and I think the thing that really made it work actually was uh, quite a lot of people say, say to me, you, you must have really had to eyeball people to get them to do this kind of stuff. And actually, we hardly had to do any of that. This worked because people wanted to do it. It fitted with their value set, it fitted with their, their professional uh, ethos. Uh, and I think in, in, in some ways it was, it was actually the fact that it wasn't an approach that we were using elsewhere that made it attractive to people. Clinicians hate targets in performance management. And so the fact that we were giving them something else was a big plus that we used. So I, I think these are all um, incredibly valuable points. Leadership is absolutely key. There's no way that we could have made the changes that we've made without the leadership attention that uh, Jerry and Fiona referred to and in many ways embody. So th this, this is not an approach, all improvement is local, this is stuff that's done by the, by the people at the point of care, but they can't do it without the leader setting the right operating environment. Um, and I think there's a bit of a phony war around improvement versus performance. Um, and I think one of the things that we need to think about is how do we move from a, a, from a perception that um, performance is a bad thing in, into a different kind of territory where performance, and, and particularly improving that performance, is just part of what we do. It's part of our public services ethos in Scotland. And some of the things that will help us to do that is thinking about how we organise as a group. Uh, how, how often do we ever get together in these kind of term, in these kind of um, circumstances to exchange that this kind of intelligence? And the other thing I think, and this goes to your plea to Mr. Swinney about um, how do we get these messages out? One of the things that we found incredibly helpful was using the data to uh, to inform and uh, involve staff. Yeah, we didn't get a lot of coverage in the newspapers of the fact that we hadn't had a central line infection, but by goodness did it motivate the people who were working in those intensive care units, just having the data, showing them it. They put it up on their walls. You, can't, you won't go to an intensive care unit in Scotland who haven't got that data on the wall of the intensive care unit, and, and very often in the patient waiting area, with someone able to explain to the patients exactly what it means, so we can use the data to do the engagement. Enjoy the rest of the day. Um, Learn, exchange ideas, have fun. Thank you very much.